All right, so this is our fourth video in the series that's going to introduce uh, the course themes and some of the regions that we're going to be studying throughout the course. Uh, so this is on the technological theme. And we're going to be looking here at the area of Mesopotamia. Now we've already looked at this region once before when we looked at the political theme and Persia. So it's the same basic area, Mesopotamia. Um, it's still in the Middle East. Uh, Persia and Mesopotamia kind of overlap even though Mesopotamia is uh, in modern Iraq and Persia is in modern Iran, but you know, they're next door neighbors. Uh, Mesopotamia is the area between the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Iraq. Uh, and Mesopotamia actually means that. It means between, so meso is a prefix that means between, and potamia means the waters. So between the waters, uh, so that's what this area is. So this is the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, sometimes this is known as the Fertile Crescent because the area kind of looks crescent-shaped. Uh, but We've already kind of looked at this area and we'll be spending a lot of time in Southwest Asia as we go through the course. But what I wanted to do today is to think about two ways that historians might look at this technological theme. Uh, one way that we would look at this is through the lens of causation. So I wanna make sure that we are uh, focusing on the lens of causation as we think about technology. So we're gonna be looking at a lot of effects today in this video. Um, and I also want us to think about how the course themes overlap with each other. So what we're gonna to see today is how this technological theme is going to overlap with other themes. All right, so a little bit about what the technological theme is looking at. So what are we looking at when we look at technology? What are we looking at or what are we looking for? And this is a very self-explanatory theme. So what we're looking for here are uh, new technologies new inventions, innovations on old ideas. We might also start looking at some new philosophies. But really the new philosophies need to be directed at these technological things. So new ways of looking at technology. Um, and I think that Mesopotamia is a really good place to look at this theme. And remember, we're just kind of going in order of the septic analogy. So technology comes forth. Uh, I think Mesopotamia is a really good place to look at this because Mesopotamia was one of the first, if not the first, areas to develop agriculture. So Mesopotamia was one of the first areas to develop agriculture, and because of that, we see a lot of technological advancements invented here simply to go along with agriculture. And 
And so as we go through this, we'll look at some of these big categories of technology and how they changed and adapted over time. Uh, so this was a place of technological advancement simply because Mesopotamia was the first to develop these things. Uh, so we're going to see some of the very first uh, pieces of pottery. We're going to see some of the very first pieces of uh, woven fabric. We're also going to see some of the first heavy usages, usages of irrigation. So you see some of the first real heavy usages of irrigation and that's because the Tigris and Euphrates rivers do not flood like the other rivers do. So the Nile River floods and it gives the Egyptians very rich soil to plant in and so they don't really need to irrigate that much but since the soil here isn't as fertile as the Nile River soil that comes when it floods. The farmers in Mesopotamia needed to irrigate their soil. And so this is where we see some of the first real heavy use of irrigation. Uh, so we see some of the first piece of pottery, fabric, irrigation. Uh, we see some of the first cities. The first cities in the world were built in Mesopotamia. Uh, and that results in the creation of some other types of technologies. For instance, masonry is like a type of pottery where you're making bricks. You make bricks for uh, walls and houses because now you have permanent settlements to defend. And all of this stuff, all of this stuff that we've just described here was caused by agriculture. So all of this stuff is an effect of agriculture. So one effect of agriculture was the need to create pottery and woven fabric to store the food, to store this surplus food. Irrigation was necessary because we need to support a larger population. And the masonry for walls and houses and such, this was all to defend the surpluses. None of which would have been necessary without agriculture. So the creation of these permanent settlements Uh, like the city of Ur or the city of Jericho. This is where we see an overlap between the social and the technological themes. Because the social theme is all about how people live. And if they're now living in settlements that require this stuff, this is where we're going to see the overlap between these two themes. If this is our social theme and this is our technological theme, what we're talking about right here is that overlap. 
This is also one of the first places, and here is a, uh, a category of technology that we're going to talk about. Uh, this is also one of the first places that we see bronze metallurgy. So this was one of the first regions. develop bronze metallurgy or more simply put making things out of bronze so bronze was a much better material so bronze was a better material to make tools from Bronze is a much better material to make tools than stone or copper. So there was a brief period between the Stone Age and the Bronze Age where we used copper. Copper by itself is a very soft metal and it doesn't make very good tools because if you're trying to use a soft metal tool to farm or uh, make pots or whatever, it's going to break or bend or be dented and it's not going to be useful. But bronze is uh, stronger. It's uh, easy to make and a strong material to make tools from. The problem with bronze though, well there, there are two problems with bronze. The first problem was pretty readily apparent to people. So the first problem was that early bronze was made from a combination of copper and arsenic. Arsenic is extremely poisonous. And so if you're making bronze out of copper and arsenic, you're probably going to end up poisoned even if you do things the right way. So we kind of quickly abandoned this. This was pretty quickly abandoned. The second problem is harder to fix because better bronze, the kind of bronze that doesn't poison you, is made from copper and tin. So it's still easy to make. You basically just melt the two metals down. Uh, more copper than tin. I think it's about 85% copper and 15% tin. You melt them down, you put them together, you get bronze. The problem is that tin is a pretty rare metal. And there wasn't a lot of tin found in uh, the region around Mesopotamia. There just wasn't a lot of tin there. So what ends up happening is that despite what we might think about really ancient societies, there were some long distance trade routes that linked tin mines to societies. Uh, most of the tin found in Mesopotamia probably would have come from Anatolia, but there is some evidence that uh, some tin came from Central Europe, or maybe even as far away as Great Britain. So there were some really long distance trade routes that brought tin to places that could use tin to make bronze. And again, where we see these, I want to highlight these overlaps. So here we see an overlap between the economic theme and the technological theme. 
So right here, what we've talked about is, you know, if we draw another Venn diagram, and we talked about the economic theme and the technological theme, what we just described was that overlap. So we've seen how technology and the social stuff can overlap. Now we've seen how the technology and the economic stuff can overlap. And once you've got bronze, you can make all sorts of interesting things. You can make uh, better, better tools for farming, which could create more food. We can also create deadlier weapons. like swords and spears made of bronze. Another thing to keep in mind here with these long distance trade routes is that Mesopotamia kind of sat right in the middle of these trade routes. So Mesopotamia sat right in the middle of these long distance trade routes, which leads to another category of technology, and that's transportation. One of the areas that Mesopotamia uh, shined in was in transportation technology. And the cutting edge transportation technology at the time is going to be the wheel and axle. Which was first developed around 3500 BCE in Mesopotamia, so about 5500 years ago. Um, and once you've got the wheel and axle, you can create uh, wagons pulled by animals to go long distances, to go long distances and carry lots of heavy stuff. Now, here's an interesting bit of, I guess, trivia. We, we see the animals that we usually think of to pull stuff long distances, horses, oxen, cattle, things like that. They don't exist in the Western Hemisphere until the European explorers bring them to the Western Hemisphere uh, in the 1500s. So what we get, and this is, this is a, a weird piece of trivia, is that in the Western Hemisphere, there was no large draft animals. That's what we call these types of animals. There were no large draft animals. In fact, the biggest animal native to the Western Hemisphere is the llama. Now, if you know anything about llamas, llamas are not very helpful. They're not going to easily pull stuff, and they're not very strong to begin with, so they wouldn't be of much use. So in the Western Hemisphere, there's no wheel. The wheel was simply not developed because there was nothing to pull the, the carts. So they didn't develop the wheel. There was no wheel in the Western Hemisphere until much, much later. And because there was no wheel, people carried stuff.
And because I'm trying to show you where these themes overlap, this is the overlap between the interactional and the technological. Because the environment The environment of the Western Hemisphere was such that they couldn't utilize this technology, and so they didn't invent it. They could utilize it in the Eastern Hemisphere, so they did. So this is how the environment impacts technology. And we'll go into one more area of technology and that is the domestication of animals. You might not necessarily think about the domestication of animals as a technology, but this is one of those things that kind of falls into a new idea or a new skill and is useful to humans. So the domestication of animals. Um, so some evidence suggests that the first domesticated dogs were seen in this region. So it, it, the evidence for this is not conclusive and there's an argument to be made that dogs were developed other places too, but there's definitely some evidence that suggests that Mesopotamia is one of the first places to see domesticated dogs, which came from wolves. So let's talk about what domestication is. So domestication is the idea that you are domestication is the idea that you are breeding, breeding traits in animals that are useful to humans. Now, these traits may be of two different varieties. You may see traits uh, to help people or you may see traits to provide more meat or wool. So if we're thinking about traits to help people we might think about uh, might help with farming like plowing fields we might see help with defense. That's where the dogs might come in. Uh, catching rats or mice, which is where dogs or cats might fall in. Or long distance travel. And that's where we might see horses or oxen or something like that. And we might also see domesticating animals, breeding animals to provide more meat uh, for the community when you slaughter them. Now, just to be clear, this is different than taming an animal. hearing my dog in the background who doesn't seem to be all that domesticated right now. Um, so taming an animal means that you are uh, acclimating wild animals to humans. So you're getting them used to humans. So domestication is different than taming an animal. 
a tame animal is still a wild animal. It's just used to people. A domesticated animal is an animal that needs to live with people. And by breeding out traits that are bad for people and breeding in traits that are good to people, you're actually changing the animal itself. So domesticated dogs are genetically different from wolves through uh, centuries and centuries and centuries of breeding out the wolf traits and breeding in the dog traits. Um, and there's actually a very interesting uh, experiment that's ongoing in, in Russia right now where scientists are like in the process of domesticating foxes. And you can see the differences between the uh, domesticated foxes and a wild fox. Like for instance, uh, their, their legs are getting shorter because they don't necessarily need to be able to run if they're going to, or run as fast, if there's going to be people taking care of them. So there are some genetic changes that happen to domesticated animals through the process of domestication. Now, let's put all of these things together. So we've got uh, permanent settlements, we've got bronze metallurgy, we've got domesticated animals. If we put all of these technologies together, if we put all the technologies we've talked about together, we can create a super technology. And the technology, if we put all of these things together, we can create chariots. So chariots are ancient super weapons. So you've got a soldier carrying a bronze spear or a bronze sword in a little cart that is pulled by horses, so domesticated animals, and they're being used to defend a permanent settlement, or they're being used to attack other permanent settlements. So putting all of this technology together can give us chariots for uh, war or defense, which helps us to overlap between the political and technological themes. So there's one more technology that I don't want to put in right now, and we'll save this one for our last theme, which is the cultural theme. And the big technology that I want to look at there is the technology of writing. And so I know we've mentioned it a little bit when we talked about uh, the economic stuff in China, but I do want to take a, a little bit of time to delve a little bit deeper into the technology of writing, which would be our cultural and technological overlap. Uh, but we'll save our discussion of writing for the cultural theme when we're going to talk about uh, maybe a little bit of religion writing, literature, and art, but we'll save that for our sixth and final video in this series. Um, until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.